Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with special guest, Dr. Gregory Brannan, and he's here today to share with us Optimal Bio. Now, Dr. Brannan graduated from the University of Southern California in 1982 and then the University of Health and Science Chicago Medical School in 1988. Dr. Brannon completed his residency in OBGYN at the University of Southern California Women's Hospital in 1992. He was a clinical associate professor at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine and has been in private practice in the Raleigh-Durham area since 1993. Dr. Brannon has a lifetime of experience working in women's health and has become an expert in human hormonal changes in particular. Since officially launching in 2012, the team at Ultimo Bio has treated well over 3,000 patients, both men and women ages 18 to 86, and the results have been astounding. Dr. Brannon personally attends to patients in each of his four locations to provide the best possible care. So let's welcome to the show, Dr. Gregory Brannon. Marianne, thank you very much. What an honor it is to have you here to talk about this. You know, it's interesting because a lot of people don't know about bioidentical hormones. Yeah, it's um, very interesting about that. Our body makes hormones. By definition, a hormone means messenger. It just takes information from one area to another to turn on a mechanism. And um, bioidentical means that the chemical we're using is actually the same exact structure our body makes. And what's really important about that, Marianne, is this. When you have a lock and key and you put the key into a lock and it turns, you know what it's going to do. and You know the actual X it's going to be. So when you have a bioidentical structure, Mayo Clinic says, says it this way. It's recognized as same. So therefore, the same function, the same metabolism, and really important, the same elimination. So therefore, most of the side effects you have on other chemicals are because they're not identical to our body. So who would be the people that would actually look at getting bioidentical hormones done? The answer is virtually anybody. Our practice is from the age of 18 to about around 90. It's depends on your stage and where you're at. And what's important on this is we look at symptoms. We call a lot of things normal today because they're common. Common does not mean normal. What you want to be is optimal. And I'll give you an example on that. Hormone levels, I'm I'm, I'm 59. I, I trained 30, 40 years ago. But when I trained a male's testosterone level, on average, the the classical bell curve uh, was a low around 800 high around 1,200 nanograms per deciliter. That's what a quote-unquote range was for a male. Today, depending where you look at, uh, some universities have it down as 175 to 700. Um, The American board has a 264 to 900. First off, it's a very wide range, but the lower line is getting way down there. A woman when I was in training was between 70 and say 150. 200 is considered a little higher than normal. Today, a woman is three to 41. So the question could be a couple of things. Number one is, what does testosterone do? As you see, it's not a male hormone. Women, depending on their cycle, are actually make between 10 and 100 times more testosterone than they make estrogens. That never sinks into people. And I'm a gynecologist by training. So the question is, is what does estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, what do these quote unquote sex hormones do in our body? You stop and think about it. Well, every cell in the body has a receptor for them. So they must be very important. And then why are the ranges going down the last 30, 40, 50 years? I'll go over that in more detail if you want me to. But that's more of the question is not what not not what, what normal is. No, no. What's optimal? I would like you to dive into that a little bit more because I'm curious why that's all happening. Beautiful. And when you look at this thing, so what happens when your testosterone level testosterone in our body convert both male and female converts to two hormones one through aromatase which can makes estradiol and the other one is through a thing called five alpha reductase which makes dihydrotestosterone and those are called anabolic steroids which means good they go through the cell membrane into the nucleus actually bind the dna and will actually make the dna make proteins which we're made out of and they also keep mitochondrial healthy 
And virtually every disease process is when mitochondria dies off. Mitochondria is the actual organelle within the cell, has its own DNA, but it actually takes, when we breathe in oxygen, that's the final thing that takes the oxygen, a thing called the electron transport um, a chain, and actually turns that energy. That's, I know it sounds nerdy, but that's the final piece that actually makes us live. So a mitochondria stays healthier, we're healthier. And that's what testosterone, estrogen, and dihydrotestosterone do, as well as other supplements you could talk about. So when you talk about, we'll dive in, why are we lower? That's what, that's what got me into this whole thing. When I started questioning myself, why was the range changing? And this is what's really important. When you look at it's called the hypothalamic pituitary axis, the hypothalamus talks to what's called the anterior pituitary through a thing called the portal vein. So it sends messengers to tell the anterior pituitary to make hormones that go to the organs. Example, the anterior pituitary makes growth hormone, uh, which makes us make have cells divide. It makes uh, TSH thyroid stimulating hormone. It does prolactin for breast milk. It does ACTH for cortisol. So it does all those. So that turns those on. So what happens is this, is that in, in the, the sex hormones, called uh, estrogen testosterone, you have a thing called FSH, which says the testicle or ovary to make testosterone, estrogen, and either sperm or egg. Now, what's interesting is it's the estradiol that goes back to the brain to turn off the production of testosterone. So that's the negative inhibitory feedback is the estradiol. Got it. It all works great. When your testosterone levels in both men and women are high enough, Estradiol gets high enough or well, goes back and turns it off. Great mechanism. But here's the problem. Synthetic estrogens in our environments. In the last 50 years, they have grown insurmountable. So today's ranges are correct, but they're not optimal because our body wants to be healthier at that time. It's actually making it more unhealthy. We'll go over what those symptoms are. But here's what's happening. You have a thing called atrazine, a pesticide. You got um, herbicide um, Roundup. You have uh, soy proteins. You have red dye number three, red dye number 40. You have all the PVC piping, phthalates, plastic sizers. You have uh, high doses of aluminum fluoride in our water. All those things inhibit, mimic estrogens and go back. And then so our body thinks we have more than we do. And that's the major problem. Wow, I'm so glad that you took the time to explain that because it if you look at it, it makes sense because we've got all these things in our environment that's really affecting our hormone levels, both men and women. Exactly. So therefore, what's the sequelae for that? And I'll go over a couple of things. Oh, I'm depressed. Okay, big deal. Big, huge deal, depression. In fact, you look at the literature, the NIH did a study in 2013 that actually looked at what's the best treatment for these disorders. What's interesting is 18% of us a year uh, get anxiety. 21% uh, of us get uh, depressive episodes throughout the year. So the number one and two cause of depressive mood swings. Well, the study showed they looked at in both men and women, the number one thing to help depression are not the pharmacological medications. Far from it. They said testosterone. They said why? Testosterone actually forms organizational and architectural structure within the brain that helps the brain actually make more cells and actually makes more neurotransmitters to talk to themselves. Nobody thinks about that. So that's one example. Also, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, stroke, uh, heart attack, um, all those things increase with lower testosterone and are improved with optimal levels of testosterone. So that's what's very frustrating to hear that these things are bad because of the connotation of the synthetics out there. And not all synthetics are bad either. I want to go over that too. That's actually a fallacy. We'll make more detail on that famous WHI study in 2002 on the true data that that showed. So when you look at this is I want to go back to, again, why are we lower and what's the sequelae? Because I can't make our body make more, but you can replace what our body used to make. And therefore, you see significant improvements in the sequelae of, of low hormone levels. So when people come to you, and I think a lot of times when people think of hormone replacement therapy, they think, oh, that's just women doing that that hit menopause. And so I'm glad that we're having this discussion because 
as you were saying, you treat people from 18 on up and, you know, it's both men and women that you're seeing as patients. When they're coming to you, what are some of the symptoms that they show up with? I know we've gone over a few of them. Well, let's go over, let's go over women first. First off is there is a quote unquote normal decrease in hormones and that is menopause. Uh, that, that's a reproductive age where your body makes it uh, eggs to fit for, for have, you know, for have the babies in the future. And when that stops making, cause the egg actually makes estrogen to help the baby implant into the uterus. Now you have a, what's interesting about this, you have women have a sudden loss of their hormones and in men, you have a gradual loss, but let's go back to women again. So there is a normal occurrence. So what happens is when you lose estrogen, there are sequelae to that hot flashes, vaginal dryness, uh, osteoporosis, dementia, twofold increase in women over men. There's a lot of theories on that. Maybe it's the rapid decrease because testosterone actually helps form estrogen in women as well, as we talked about before. So those are some of the menopausal aspects of it. Uh, decreased libido. I don't care if you're 25 years of age and married or 55. Decreased libido can happen at any age. Again, because these values are decreased. And it's interesting about libido. It's not just a physical act. It's an emotional act. And you could actually look at the brain, the hippocampus and limbic area of the brain, when they have low estrogen testosterone, that part of the brain actually shrivels up a little bit. When you get it back to levels, that's why you have the emotional part, not just the physical part. So that's on the, that's on the menopausal side. Premenopausal, PMS is a real thing. It's not make-believe. Menstrual migraines are real things. And these are things that have been shown to actually improve with optimal uh, hormonal balance with testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone. So that's the woman. Um, men, and both again, it's, it's the big one is this, both, I don't care, ages or not, tired of being tired. That's the biggest thing. I'm just tired, Greg. It's common to come home and want to sleep after I work all day. It's common that I sit down, I do nothing on the weekend. No, it's not. It may be common, but it's not because we don't want to do that. We don't have the gasoline in our tank. And, and, and these testosterone estrogens are literally the gasoline in our tank to motivate us. For men, lack of motivation, lack of their drive, um, again, libido, e, uh, ED, those kind of things are there. So those are the symptoms. And we see the symptoms improve when you have your testosterone increased level supposed to be at. So when we look at this, you know, all together, what are some of the myths that people have when it comes to hormone replacement? Number one, it's cancer. I can't stress that enough. Um, what happens is we hear this fear of this cancer. Let's, 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 think, let's use our brain a little bit here. Just common sense. Not need, need to be a doctor on this. If testosterone, go, we'll go male first. If testosterone caused prostate cancer, when does a man's testosterone peak? High teens, early 20s. Why does prostate cancer come when men are older, when their testosterone level is lower? It, it can't cause by that. In fact, Dr. Morgenthaler did a, a great book out of Harvard called uh, uh, Testosterone for Life. And he went back to the original paper. In uh, 1941, Dr. Huggins did a paper that said giving testosterone to men made prostate cancer increase. Well, the question was this, Dr. Morgenthal asked, was this, how many men were in the study? One. One. And that paper has been quoted multiple times. One man in the study who already was castrated, so he made no estrogen, no testosterone. So Dr. Morgenthal has a money paper showing we know the prostate is fully saturated with level when it's at 90. So anything under 90, yes, will make it grow. Anything over 90, it doesn't because the cells are already, the receptor sites are already saturated. He did papers showing that men actually with prostate cancer improve. In fact, one study showed 56% of his men Prostate cancer two and a half liters was actually uh, was gone, was not detectable, and 40% were the same size or smaller. He also did a paper showing that men with prostate cancer live longer and better on testosterone because their heart's better, their brain's better. So stroke, heart attack are all diminished. Also, the fallacy of testosterone causing heart attack. It's just the opposite. Multiple papers. In my book, we have these papers there showing men who have a history of heart attack given testosterone, have a better, what's called left ventricular outflow because the heart works better with testosterone. Sudden funny thing, the heart cells have the most testosterone receptors in the brain. So you start looking at this is, do you want to be a body of 18 years of age or 80 years of age? It makes com complete sense. 
that you want to have the young physio physiology. You can't decrease time. There's no, I'm not talking about, you know, reversing aging. I'm just talking about aging gracefully. So that's with the men. So that's one of the fallacies. Heart attack, stroke, diabetes, cancer are all improved with optimal levels of testosterone. Now, a woman. There's a phenomenal book called Estrogen Matters by a famous oncologist, Dr. Blooming and Dr. Travis, who's, a, uh, who's an epidemiologist. And they went back and looked at this famous paper, the WHI study in 2001 and to 2002. And it's interesting. The book goes into detail of how they were using Premer and Proveric synthetics. But they actually showed in that paper that the 26 percent increase in breast cancer, even though it increased with the synthetics, um, they, they, they talk about that the study, the conclusion of the study was already written by the by not by the guys who did it. But by the editors of the New England Journal, because they had they said they spent a billion dollars on this study. And we have to find something. So the book goes through the detail of that. So what they did is they do a they did a summary of in, in their book table two that shows hormone therapy and breast cancer, a whole timeline of studies from 1942 to 2008. And the final paper in 2008 said this. It says they looked at moms, women with BRCA gene one, and they said the theory is that hormone increases that. And they said, actually, the study shows it is not an increased risk in breast cancer. And factually, it's a decreased risk. Let's use our brains again. When's a woman peaking their testosterone, their progesterone, their estrogen? Say 25, 28 when they're pregnant. Is cancer prevalent then? The answer is no. Again, optimal hormonal balance actually makes cells healthier. And remember, the, the mitochondria healthier, which actually makes our disease processes less. And I know I'm rambling. I could do this all day on this. This was frustrates me so much. We'll talk about osteoporosis in a menopausal woman. A woman loses 5% of bone mass per year. Let's stop and let that sink in. We hear about breast cancer, and don't get me wrong, it's a terrible disease. But 3% of women die of breast cancer. 24% of women die of cardiovascular disease. And this protects cardiovascular disease. 40,000 people a year die of hip fractures. 40,000 women die of breast cancer. They're equivalent. But yet we do nothing for the osteoporosis part where testosterone, estrogen, actually, you don't lose 5% of bone mass per year. You gain 8.3% of bone mass per year. So there's so many benefits of having a young physiology, a young chemistry for our bodies to age gracefully. Yeah, when you look at all the science, it just makes sense to do things this way. You know, and that's why I've been such a big proponent of this. You know, how when we look at when people start getting into hormone replacement therapy, how do they get their hormone levels checked? There's the gold standard is blood. So we do saliva, but the algorithms that we use for the actual dosing, and I'll go over why, why we use pellets, is based on blood, which is the most accurate. Um, and then I get our range based upon that. So it's a blood draw. So um, you talked about pellets. Um, so once they do the blood draw, how does the process work from then, from there to, you know, getting to a place where they're, you know, having the hormones in their system? Okay. Here's what's important. The very first time we isolated a androgen in our body was in Berlin in 1931. It was called androstyone, which is the, the actually metabolite before testosterone. They found it in bulls. In 1935, they found a more potent one. Uh, in a man, they collected a, a bunch of men's uh, urine and found the metabolite in the testosterone in the urine. So 1935 was the first time they've isolated testosterone. 1937 was the first paper published on hormone therapy. And it was with what? Pellets. They gave men pellets to increase their levels. They found it peaked in one month and tapered off in six months. So it, gave, it mimicked, it mimicked the production of, our, of the testosterone in the, uh, uh, of the testicle more than any other thing. Now, th that was in, 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 in men. Women, the first day was 1938. Same thing, using pellets, which has an easy onset, a constant slow release. So, therefore, it mimics our ovaries, the woman's ovaries as well. So, it mimics the output the best. In 1947 was a, again, this is sound nerdy, the way testosterone is, relative to a horizontal plane, it's called an alpha or a beta. Our body makes 17 beta testosterone, the lock and key again. It works per perfectly. Well, they made an oral version called the 17 alpha in 1947. That increased liver clotting and some cancer. So therefore, that's where the bad rep came back. We don't, we don't use that anymore. 
Then in the mid forties, some um, injections came because they wanted to see if they can use a, have the ester, the testosterone molecule bound to an ester and then see how that works instead of having a pellet placement. Well, there's nothing wrong with that per se, but the problem on that is that, again, the pellet has a constant steady state. The shot goes up and down every two and a half days. That's where you heard about the roid rage. So to mimic our, our gonads the best would be to have a steady state mimic, and that's the pellet. So that's why we use the pellet. And it's been used the longest, used in America since 1939. And we use a natural compound uh, made out of organic yam. So we can actually get our structure, again, bioidentical from yam, a, a plant source, that's the exact same structure our body makes. And then we, based upon our algorithm and certain parameters, we get an actual dose. So our dosing is individualized per person. There's not a one standard size. So when we look at this, you know, when someone has a pellets placed, how long do they, how long does it take for them to start feeling the benefits? If you check the blood level, it's up the next day. But the way it works, it has to convert, you know, go, go into the cell membrane, to the nuclear membrane, bind the receptor site. So bottom line is a few days to a couple weeks. It depends what the symptoms are. Um, libido, energy, about two weeks. Um, things like hot flashes can be a few hours. Um, it depends on what the symptoms are. But roughly between one and two weeks, you're trying to see improvement. Body changes, that's usually if you take advantage. Again, this is not a panacea. So eating, the most important thing in life is to sleep properly. And back to testosterone, testosterone actually helps us sleep five REM cycles, about seven and a half hours, and wake up refreshed. It gets us in a nice deep delta state that the studies have shown that to help our sleep. So sleep first, our nutrition, exercise, and then hormone balance with the right supplements. So that's what we do here at Optimal Bio. So roughly, you start seeing body changes probably in about two to six months based upon those kind of aspects. But you'll get the strength. And sorry, if you do exercise, you'll see strength within about a month. Man, that's so impressive. You know, when you look at that and all the benefits that come with it, it makes it in many ways like something people should really investigate. It, you know, it, it is regional right now and you're starting to grow. We're in the, the East Coast in, in North Carolina. But again, I'm an OB-GYN by training. And so I'm an expert in, in female endocrinology and obviously trained in, in all endocrinology. And you start looking at this, but that, that's what got me going on this about oh, 10, 12 years ago was, First off is what got me on about 20 years ago. I mean, young women in my office saying they had no libido. And you're like, okay, why? And I started asking questions. So I started doing this search, started researching on this kind of stuff. And I started seeing it in men. And I started seeing studies. Um, there was a, in the Lancet in, in England about three months ago showing uh, couples being intimate roughly about 50% of them. It was like 50, 47% of them were intimate roughly once every three months. So I was seeing, is this normal? The answer is if you have a Ferrari, and you armor all the tires and wax the, the paint. That's great. But you can't drive it without gas. That's what I try to tell me. We're all Ferraris. We, our gas is empty. So we got to focus on, on the most important parts. So when you talk about what you're talking about there is why don't they look it out? I think because you got these, these, these uh, reports on the media. Oh, my gosh, this is bad. People get scared of it. And I guess I want to use the data here. The number one cause of death in America is medical treatment. FDA approved medical treatment. We don't, we don't listen to that. You know, we just blow that off. Oh my gosh, it causes this. And then you have experts that are in the world here doing the studies of the paper. So I'm studying them, look at the details of it. It just blows things away. That's why I go back. I'm a very basic guy. I'm not smart. 80, 50 years ago, women were 800, 1200 men. I mean, men were 800, 1200 women were roughly uh, 70 to 180, 200. Why are we lower? And what's the sequelae? And that got, that got me going to just read a ton of volumes of literature and papers saying, whoa, here's why it is and here's how we can do it. And oh, by the way, the treatment's been around since the 1930s. Well, and for our listeners, I also want to make the distinction. I know I've been calling it hormone replacement therapy, but it's bioidentical hormone replacement therapy because mm -hmm. there's a difference with the two of those. Yes, I, and I, I think now interesting in, in, in some books I read, some it, great articles I read, again, even the synthetics don't have the risk people say they do to the point they have they do. But they've converted over from the net, from uh, synthetic progesterone, the Provera, to all to natural progesterone, which because again, it mimics. So my concept is if you convert it from the natural to the natural progesterone, I'd convert to the natural estrogen and natural testosterone, which you do. So the answer is yes. 
And it's a sustained release is what's so important too. Having the pellet is a sustained release. Therefore, there's no ups and downs. There's no roid rage. In fact, I use this for anger problems. I use this for PTSD. I use this for anxiety and depression because it makes you up, not this roid rage. The roid rage is when with the injections that have a half-life of two and a half days, it's the dropping that leads to that. Or the old man, the, the, the grumpy old man syndrome is because they're low, not because they're high. And from the spouses I have back in the husbands, it's like, whoa, he's kind again. He's, he's, he's nice again. He's, his patients are better. Again, it goes back to the neuroplasticity of the brain. The brain makes more dendrites, makes more neurotransmitters. It works in the hippocampus area. All these things have scientific basis for why it works. So you mentioned PTSD. I like, I I know you you explained why it works. Are you seeing a lot of patients, maybe veterans that have been diagnosed with PTSD that hormone, the bioidentical hormone replacement therapy is helping? Yes, ma'am. That's a niche of the practice I never thought about. Uh, But I started getting guys who Googled and looked up and read my book who are young men, 25, 35 years of age, who goes, boy, I have these symptoms to this age. And I'm checking their levels and their levels, again, even by today's standards, 264 standard are low. And I'm getting, again, by 30-year standards, under 800 is low. And I'm getting these men that look like Hercules, but they have every symptom of an old man. They're, they look like Hercules because they got to for their job, but their levels uh, are under 100. And then I got the 40, 45-year-olds who've done their, done, done, you know, done their service. They're coming back home and their relationship with their wives, their family. And they're thinking that there are multiple medications. And I don't, I don't make this a simple thing. This is not simple. TBI and PTSD are very complex. But at the core of it is, again, let's go back to the brain. Here's what happens is, again, in TBI, you have extrinsic and intrinsic factors, shockwaves, bombs going off, loud noises. The hypothalamus talks to the anti pituitary, and they're, they're enlarged in a very hard, bony uh, environment. The posterior uh, pituitary gets the blood flow supply from a completely different area. So that's why it does not affect that particular one, but it affects the anterior because why? The shock waves make it shake within that bony area so that they actually stop talking to each other. The number one um, hormone that decreases in, PT- in TBI and PTSD is growth hormone. Number two is testosterone and the sex hormones which makes complete sense because those are actually the ones that work on the brain for our moods. They make a chemical called caspis would actually, um, actually make the way that the neuron talks to the other neuron actually affects that presynaptic neuron. So it actually inhibits it. We have a mechanism of this. Okay. There's a mechanism. That's why the Zoloft's and those medications are there because they're trying to help that connection. But what if you can make more connections and make more transmitters by yourself? And that's where testosterone comes into play. So that's why we, we use that. And we've seen that occur. And we've seen a bunch of our men and women, again, never stop counseling, never stop with the training, never that, but enhance their, their recovery back to more who they are as individuals. I, I don't usually do, I don't usually do a normal. I'm talking how they are optimal for themselves. I actually wrote a paper on this as well. It's on our website. And uh, the, but the science is clearly there. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, so you've got a lot of great information on your website where people can, you know, see a video that talks about, you know, BHRT and anti-aging and just the benefits for both men and women as well. You know, doctor, it, it has me kind of thinking, what initially got you interested in this? I know you were talking years ago that you saw, because, I mean, you, you've been a really successful OBGYN. And then just seeing what's happening with your patients coming in, is that kind of what inspired you? Yeah, I was blessed my practice. Um, uh, my, my, my partner and I, over the years, we had over 35,000 patients, which is a very busy OB practice and GYN practice. And what got me into all this stuff is overall nutrition. Um, again, I've seen young, young couples not being happy, seen a lot of diabetes, uh, a lot of depression, PMS, postpartum. These are not make believe they're real. Um, I got really passionate about food and nutrition. Um, the food pyramid was pushed through by the grain companies. Uh, Thomas Jefferson said, if you ever allow the government to tell you what medicines to take or food to eat, you'll be in a worse state of tyranny. So I believe truly that the government has a phenomenal role, a phenomenal role in protecting us, 
uh, from uh, from foreign enemies and domestic and for free trade. That's what the Constitution says. Um, that's one of my other pet passions is the Constitution. And I believe what happened, you look at the government getting involved in our nutrition and our supplementation, all that kind of stuff. I'm talking the federal level. There's all there, there, there are, there's actually lobbyists in this benefits that they may not actually look at the individual. And one of those key things is you look at diabetes, metabolic syndrome, PCOS, cardiovascular disease. The mid-70s, that's our kicking in. What happened? This food pyramid, eating a lot of grains, 9 to 13 grains a day. There's zero scientific evidence showing that. And that actually led to a decrease in what? Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. So you look back at it, the government got involved. I'm, I'm not saying they did it on purpose, but there's sequelae to this. We ate differently. We ate a lot of vegetables, a lot of free-range chicken, grass-fed beef. And there's benefits to that. I can quote papers from the 1850s on this, showing how we lived healthier. We died of dirty water and we died of trauma, but we didn't have these chronic diseases. So what happened is we made some assumptions that we, if you eat this way and do this stuff, we'll be better. But now we're seeing the sequelae of that 30, 40 years of that being wrong. That's why you're seeing tra uh, um, transient um, uh, time-restricted feeding, in, uh, fasting, keto, paleo. These things are coming, and all they are is basically how we used to do this 100 years ago. So you asked me how I got to this. The first thing was seeing diabetes become rampant in my pregnant patients. Uh, diabetes in myself. Um, at a time, 15, about 12, 13, 15 years ago, I was doing triathlons, and I was diabetic. I found out my testosterone was low, and I was eating too many grains. I literally changed my diet, got on testosterone. I lost 20 pounds, got more leaner. My hemoglobin AC went normal, fast emotion went normal by just making my numbers optimal. So the first guinea pig was me and then my diabetic patients within my practice. And this just came. And I started, I'm a very, a big reader. I read about four or five hours a day on science. And it led to this. Well, I'm so glad it did, doctor. I mean, my goodness, you're such a resource on this topic. If it's out there, you know about it when it comes to BHRT. Where can our listeners connect with you and learn more about your work and if they need to make an appointment with you? Uh, we have four offices in North Carolina. We have in Charlotte, Southern Pines, Wilmington, and Cary. Our, our name of our company is Optimal Bio. Uh, just Google that. Our, our, our um, website is OptimalBioBHRT.com. Uh, please Google, check all that out. We're all over Facebook, all that kind of stuff. A side note. Uh, I'm going to start in uh, later this month and later in November, I'm going to be starting a, a formal podcast once a week on these, these topics. So we, we have a research, as you said, on our website, we probably, I probably made 50 videos on topics on detoxification, on how to eat, on supplementation, vitamin D. We've already done all that, but now we're going to put it into a more formal way on our website, as well as a podcast. And we're also going to YouTube that as well. So my, my thing is we don't make, Knowledge is power. We, we know that. And what's important is the lack of knowledge stops us from acting. And I really believe in this acronym I made up called EPA. We have to educate, prepare, and then act. So for me, I, the pellets to me are tertiary. It's always why are we doing it? Education. And why are we doing it as an individual? Why is Marianne doing it? Why is Greg doing it? Why is Bob doing it? That's the most important. And we focus on the individual. Yes, we do treat with op we, we do treat with bioidentical hormones. We also have a nutritionist. We don't do weight loss. We do wellness to make sure that you're wellness on this to make sure you understand why. We do a lot of supplementation. I could spend hours just talking why vitamin D is improved, why vitamin C is important, and the law three. And so what we're going to do on our website is have all those videos, have it all transcribed as well, and then have an active podcast and a YouTube channel for more information. Because information is power, bottom line. So Optimal Bio is our web, is our company. Optimal Bio, BHRT.com is uh, you're our source for Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. All that is out there. And also I wrote, I'm right in the process of writing my third book um, on this uh, topic. So it's all in a, a form. It's a very simple, read about 150 pages uh, with science, with stories, with uh, patient testimonies on how this has worked. Oh my gosh, doctor. I mean, you've got so much great information on this. I mean, I, I really appreciate you taking the time to share all this with us today. You know, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us. No, well, Marianne, I can't thank you enough for what you're doing. And again, I, I'm very honored to be here. Well, thank you, Dr. Brandon. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you and to talk about the work you're doing and the lives you're impacting. Again, if you'd like to connect with Dr. Brandon, you can at OptimalBio.com for more information. 
Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.